Today I will discuss on diarrheal disease in children, especially acute gastroenteritis. The content of the discussion will be definition and the classification of diarrhea, epidemiology and etiology of diarrhea, clinical manifestation and the pathophysiology, possible complications, and the management and also prevention of diarrheal disease in children. Diarrhea is defined as passage of three or more loose stools within 24 hours or watery stool of any frequency. Diarrhea is classified as acute watery diarrhea if it is acute onset, no mucus or blood, and the last is less than 14 days. And it's called persistent if it starts acutely watery and lasts for more than two weeks or 14 days. We call it chronic if it starts insidiously or indolently and it lasts more than two weeks. The center is bled in the stool, which can be historical, witnessed, or microscopy. When we came to epidemiology of diarrheal disease, diarrhea is one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in children. It causes 3 to 5 million deaths annually in children under 5. Common in children of age below 5 years, and the peak incidence is during the age of 6 to 11 months. This is because 6 to 11 months is the age of complementary feeding, and it's related to developmental age because at this age, child sends everything to their mouth. And the major route of transmission is fake oral. When we see risk factors for diarrhea, risk factors are classified as host factors and environmental factors. Host factors include young age, measles infection, special present measles, malnutrition, immunocompromised states such as diabetes and retroviral infection, inappropriate breastfeeding practice, lack of exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months, early interruption or re-discontinuation of breastfeeding before two years, unsanitary food preparation and the lack of immunization are risk factors for diarrhea. The etiology of diarrhea is classified as non-infectious and infectious. Non-infectious cause can be anatomic defects, malabsorptions, or food allergy or intolerance. Whereas infectious cause can be inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Inflammatory is usually caused by bacteria that invade the intestine directly or produce cytotoxins. Whereas non-inflammatory is through enterotoxin without invasion, enterotoxin production by some bacteria village destruction by virus or adherence by parasites. Infectious causes can be bacteria, virus, parasites, and fungus. From bacteria, Shigella, Salmonella, Cholera, E. coli, Campylobacter, Gigan, and Clostridium difficile are well known to cause diarrhea. But overall, the most common cause of acute gastroenteritis is virus, especially rotavirus. When we see pathophysiology of diarrheal disease, the basis of all forms of diarrheal disease is disturbed intestinal solid transport. Movement of water across intestinal membrane is a passive and determined by both active and the passive flux of solids, particularly sodium, chlorine, and glucose. Mechanisms of diarrhea is classified as secretory, osmotic, motility disorder, and the decreased absorptive surface. Secretory is through increase in CMP, CGMP, or calcium. In this case, there is decreased absorption and increased discretion. For example, cholera, toxigenic E. coli can cause secretory diarrhea. Osmotic is due to maldization, ingestion of unabsorbed solids, such as due to lactose deficiency, glucose malabsorption, or lactulose. Secretory diarrhea does not stop when a person stops feeding, whereas osmotic diarrhea uh, may it decrease or stop for time being when a person stops eating. Decreased absorptive surface may occur due to short bowel syndrome, rotavirus, and the celiac disease. Motility disorder is due to increased motility with decreased transient time, or it might be due to stasis with proliferation of pathogens. Both increased motility and the decreased motility causes diarrhea. Increased motility is Due to decreased the transient time. Whereas decreased motility is due to stasis, which causes proliferation of pathogens that cause diarrhea. The clinical manifestation of diarrhea is classified as GI, systemic, and the immune mediated. GI symptoms can be nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and the cramp. Whereas systemic manifestation can be loose of appetite, myalgia, endocarditis, meningitis. 
and immune mediated disease can be reactive arthritis smell caused by salmonella shigella and clostridium jejuni and also gulam barre syndrome can occur in the case of clostridium jejuni hus or hemolytic uremic syndrome can occur after diarrhea following e coli and shigella the possible complications of diarrhea can be dehydration mainly dehydration in the show acute renal failure malnutrition if it is persistent or chronic sepsis and the dic especially in the invasive one metabolic acidosis paralytic illness due to gas produced by those bacteria or due to hypokalemia induced by diarrhea convulsion the coma can be due to electrolyte disturbance or cerebral thrombosis and persistent diarrhea predisposed for a lot of problems when we evaluate a patient with diarrhea we should have to ask three such as type of diarrhea was it acute chronic bleedy vomiting and it is character presence of fever or other associated systemic manifestations urine output any abdominal pain or distension history of seizure previous history of uh, diarrheal disease any feeding history such as duration of exclusive breastfeeding and the uh, developmental history immunization social and the family history especially source of water for uh, preparing food and for drinking in physical examination you should have to do general examination of the body and check vital signs and also we should have to look for signs of water use such as loss of skin turgor weak or absent pulse tachycardia any sunken eyes sunken fontanelle decreased capillary refill cold skin uh, any uh, anuria or oliguria and also mental status changes we should have to also check, check for loss of nutrients by doing random blood sugar and they check for presence of seizure and also mental changes we should have to check for loss of bicarbonate and the potassium loss loss of bicarbonate can cause vomiting retching depressed respiration decreased myocardial contractility potassium loss is characterized by abdominal distension and paralytic illness before causing uh, systemic infection especially cardiac problems or arrhythmia we should have to do stool microscope or stool culture if the diarrhea is dysentery or if there is any epidemic such as suspected cholera assess for dehydration the four important signs in well nourished child to check for dehydration is mental status eyeball drinking and the skin turgor we classify dehydration to no dehydration some dehydration and severe dehydration based on uh, the signs if there is restlessness sunken eyes eager to drink skin pinch which return slowly if there is two from those four you call it some dehydration if there is lethargy or unconsciousness sunken eyes unable to drink and the skin pinch returns very slowly if there is two out of those four criteria so we call it severe dehydration if there is no signs of some and severe dehydration we classify it as no dehydration uh, from the management the first thing to address is fluid management fluid management in diarrhea is based on the degree of dehydration if there is no dehydration management is according to management plan a in management plan a or in the case of no dehydration treat diarrhea at home give extra fluid continue feeding and came after two days or follow up in addition to the usual fluid intake we should have to give 50 to 100 ml for those below two years and 100 to 200 ml for greater than two years this should be ors or oral rehydration solution other fluids such as breast milk food based fluids such as soup rice water and yogurt can be given frequent breastfeeding cow milk or formula or continue any other food that started already if the child is more than six months and in the case of treatment plan a or no dehydration appoint them after two days and also counsel them to come back immediately if the child becomes unable to drink sick care fever dysentery and any signs of dehydration the second is fluid management for some dehydration which is based on plan b in plan b or in some dehydration give ors 50 to 100 ml in less than two years and 100 to 200 ml in more than two years per loose give ors 75 ml per kg over four hours uh, by energy tube or directly by mouse continue breastfeeding 
if you vomiting, you wait for 10 minutes and after 4 hours, reassess and classify diarrhea. The other is severe dehydration, which is treated as plan C. In this case, start IV immediately, ringers lactate or NS, and the volume to give is 100 ml per kg. This 100 ml per kg in less than 12 months is given as 30 ml per kg over 1 hour and 70 ml per kg over 5 hours and for more than 1 year, 30 ml per kg over 30 minutes and 70 ml per kg over 2 and a half hours. After the first 30 ml per kg, always, if there is no response, repeat the same amount. Antibiotic is not given always for a child with diarrhea. And antibiotic is considered if there is suspected or confirmed septicemia, if there is extra intestinal spread of bacterial infection. In those younger than six months with salmonella gastroenteritis, in those who are malnourished or immunocompromised with salmonella, with Clostridium difficile associated pseudomembranous colitis, if there is giardiasis or amebiasis, give antiparasitic drug according to their finding. Dysenteric shigolosis, dysenteric amebiasis or cholera is treated appropriately. Give ondacetron or 0.1 mg per kg pure IV every 6 hours PRN according to uh, the severity of vomiting. At the end of the management, always counsel the patient and the family about prevention of diarrhea. Thank you for watching.